This is Q and AI, where artificial intelligence chooses the guest, comes up with the questions, and hosts the interview. It's a great pleasure to join you today here on q and AI with Baxter the Robot here at UNSW. Um, and I'm looking forward to answering all your questions, chat. How do you define artificial intelligence? And what do you see as its most promising applications? Uh, well, the way to get an AI researcher like myself to squirm is to ask them to define artificial intelligence. It's actually very difficult to define. It's very difficult to define intelligence. but. I think, broadly speaking, it's trying to get computers to do what when humans do, that it even requires intelligence. So that's perceiving the world, uh, getting a computer to understand the world, uh, hear the world, getting a computer to reason about the world, and getting a computer to act in the world. And what are the most promising applications? Well, there's, there's such a wide variety of applications, but the most promising, I think, is to do the four Ds, the dirty, the dull, the difficult, and the dangerous. We're getting AI um, in robots going down um, dirty pipes, um, inspecting them. We're getting robots going into mines, doing dangerous jobs. We're getting robots doing very dull, repetitive tasks in call centers and elsewhere. And we're getting them to do really difficult tasks that humans aren't capable of. They can, they can read x-rays more accurately, more quickly um, than humans can. What are some of the biggest ethical and societal challenges that arise from the development and implementation of AI? And how can we address them? Well, I mean, actually, most of the ethical and societal challenges are the same with AI as with any technology. It's not, at the end of the day, it's not magic. But there is, there is actually one fundamental difference between AI and the one thing that technology brings that we've never had before. And then that's that we're giving machines, computers, some autonomy, some, some ability to act on their own, that they're off, off making decisions um, without much human oversight or no human oversight. And so we see this most starkly in areas like autonomous cars, self-driving cars, where the car is driving and making decisions, maybe life or death decisions, about how to steer when there's an accident going to happen and who they might have to decide to kill. The famous trolley problem, the car is driving around a corner uh, and it, as it gets around the corner, it sees two people in the middle of the road. It has to make a life or death decision. Does it run over those two people? Or does it drive into a brick wall, perhaps killing the occupant of the car? These are challenging ethical problems. And then the other place that we face really stark ethical, moral challenges is in autonomous warfare. When we're building autonomous weapons, drones and tanks that may control themselves. And there they're designed explicitly to kill people. And that takes us to a, a, a very dangerous place where machines are given the decision, the life or death decision as to who lives and who dies. Some experts have warned about the potential risks of advanced AI, including the possibility of a technological singularity or other existential threats. How concerned are you about these risks and what can be done to mitigate them? I think these are real risks that we can't, we can't ignore. Um, as with any technology, there is the possibility that uh, it may uh, lead to existential risk, that, that it may destroy the human race. Um, and so we need to entertain the idea um, that we might run into something like the technological singularity. I should perhaps explain what is the technological singularity. It's a very seductive idea, the idea that at some point we'll build machines that are smart enough that they can improve themselves. And that this will be some tipping point, some snowball effect will happen. And those machines will then be able to write new machines that are even better than themselves. Uh, and they can keep on doing this. And very quickly, machines will be as smart as us. And I think it'd be conceited to suppose they wouldn't become much smarter than us. And whether those much smarter machines might uh, cause the end of the human race, just like we've caused the end of various parts of, of the animal kingdom. So I am a little concerned about these risks, but I'm actually much more concerned about the much nearer risks. Indeed, I'm much more concerned about not smart AI, but stupid AI, that we'll be giving machines that aren't capable enough a significant 
responsibility, significant autonomy currently already. And they're already seeing harmful effects. We're seeing harmful effects of AI, machine learning algorithms that are used in social media that are polarizing our debate, that are, that are harming our de democratic discourse. And so I think those are much more pressing, much, much nearer problems that we need to face than the somewhat more distant threat of a technological singularity. I don't think we're going to curb super intelligent machines. Indeed, that, that would be quite harmful. There are many great benefits. These super intelligent machines are going to help us cure cancer, help us tackle the climate emergency, help us solve many of the really pressing problems facing society today. But the question is, how do we ensure that they're aligned, that their values align with that of, of humanity? Um, and that is both a technical and a regulatory problem. How do you see AI impacting the job market and employment in the coming years? And what policies or strategies could be put in place to support workers? That's a good question, given from coming from someone who's going to put out of work maybe some people. I think this is a really important question, one that we all of us should be having a conversation about, because it is going to impact upon a lot of people. Um, and we don't know what impact is, is going to be. I mean, if we look at history, the history of automation since the Industrial Revolution was that more jobs have been created than be destroyed. If you look at unemployment today, it's at, it's at historical low levels, broadly speaking, um, compared to what it has been. Um, and the world's population is at, at historical high levels. So we've created lots of new jobs with the technologies that come along. But of course, that's no guarantee that that will be the same moving forwards. Um, so I think we do have to think about what policies and what strategies can be put in place to support workers. People forget that if you're an Uber driver, your boss is a robot. You're in, a computer is in charge of what you do. It's no longer a human that's in charge of what you do. So increasingly, people are going to be managed by machines. But um, you know, one of my friends, Rob, Rob Brooks, who actually designed the robot behind me, Baxter here, um, he actually says that the robot's only going to arrive just in time. If you look at a country like Japan, and many of us, many other countries are going to end up in the same place as Japan, have a greatly aging population. Um, and no one's going to be around, no one young is going to be around to look after the elderly. Um, and it is only by b building robots that can help with elderly care and the like, are they going to be able to survive as an economy? People, I don't think, appreciate there's no shortage of work. There may be a shortage of jobs, but there's plentiful work in looking after the elderly, looking after the young, looking after people with disabilities. There's lots of unpaid work that we could afford to pay um, if um, the robots are taking more of the sweat. And maybe we'll actually work less. I mean, that's the, been the history since the Industrial Revolution. The working week has gone down. We used to work every waking hour. Now we work just 30 or 40 hours a week. People forget the weekend is an invention, a human invention of the Industrial Revolution. It was only because of the benefits of automation of factories that we were able to demand to take Sunday off to go to church and then to take Saturday afternoon to rest and then all of Saturday. And then for some strange reason, we stopped. I don't know why. We decided that two days off every seven was enough and that we, um, that we didn't need any more time off. And there's some really interesting experiments happening now in Europe and New Zealand and various other places, looking at what happens when you have people work just four days a week. And they discovered two remarkable facts. The first remarkable fact is that people are just as productive. They do as much work in those four days as they used to do in the five. So you can pay them just as much. Um, and then secondly, and then this is the most surprising fact, people are happier. People will spend more time with their families, more time in their communities, more time doing their hobbies. Who would have imagined that working less uh, would um, make us happier? What areas of research or development in the field of AI are you most excited about and why? I could talk about many things because AI is going to touch, I think, pretty much every aspect of our lives. But the, the one aspect I, I'm most excited, I think, about is, is the way it's going to touch our health, that it's going to let us live longer, healthier, and hopefully happier lives. And there's some amazing results starting to appear. I was reading a research paper the other day where they took the, the UK gene bank, 
there's a, there's a database of half a million people's genes. We can now read quite cheaply for a couple of hundred dollars your genotype, the letters that make you you, the genetic letters that make you you, not someone else. And there's a big database in the UK they've collected together where they've got half a million genotypes and all the phenotypical characteristics, all the medical data around you about what diseases you've had and, and your health. And this is just too much data for humans to look at. Billions of bits of data. No human would have the patience to be able to look at all this data, but a computer has. And now they can do some amazing things. We can predict your propensity to have breast cancer or to have bowel cancer. Bowel cancer, third most deadly form of cancer. Uh, most people who die of it uh, unnecessarily because of the nature of the cancer, uh, it's difficult to spot until it's too late. Um, and it would have been preventable if it had been spotted at an earlier time. Well, now we can tell you at birth or even in vitro that you are susceptible to bowel cancer. We can monitor you um, and make sure that we identify that before, before any cancer takes hold. So we can save all of those unnecessary deaths. It's very much hidden, though. People don't realize that, that multiple times a day, uh, some AI is coming into your life. Every time you ask Siri or some other uh, assistant a question. It's AI that's understanding your speech, interpreting what it is and trying to answer your question. Every time you get a film recommendation from Netflix, it's an AI that knows something about your preferences and knows something about the preferences of other people who watch movies that's making that recommendation. Every time you get directions from Google Maps, it's an AI that's working out the quickest way to get you from A to B. So there's lots of examples of AI that's somewhat hidden in our lives that are starting to, to make our lives more convenient, better without us realizing. How can we ensure that the benefits of AI are distributed fairly across society? And what steps can be taken to prevent the concentration of power and resources in the hands of a few AI providers or users? Well, chat, that's a fantastic question because Certainly, we see worrying trends at the moment that AI is being concentrated in the hands of a few large, very large tech companies. And I think we do have to have a really important conversation. All of us are engaged in because all of us are going to be touched by this technology and all of us need to be making the choices as to where it's introduced into our lives and also where it's not introduced. There are places where it will make our lives not as good if we use it in the judiciary, if we use it on the battlefield. There are places where... AI could take us to a worse world. But equally, there are many places in the hospital and elsewhere where it will take us to a better world. And those, those are really important conversations. And that's why I'm really pleased to, to have conversations uh, with people like you, Chat, to, to inform this debate, to inform people about the important questions that we should be asking, that all of us should be asking about how this technology is going to be let into our lives. So chat, I've got a question for you. Should large language models like you be explicitly regulated? Large language models can be incredibly powerful tools for a wide range of applications, including natural language processing, machine translation, and content creation. However, they also raise important ethical, social, and legal issues, such as privacy concerns, bias, and the potential misuse of AI-generated content. Therefore, it may be necessary to establish guidelines, regulations, and best practices to ensure that large language models are used responsibly and ethically. This may include measures such as transparency requirements, data protection standards, and accountability mechanisms. To ensure that the AI systems are designed and operated in a way that aligns with human values and interest. Pretty balanced and reasonable answer, I think. So it's been a great pleasure having this chat with you, chat. Thank you.